Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our virtual panel. I am Lee Drutman, a uh, senior fellow in the political reform program at New America, and a very proud co-editor of this exciting new volume, Congress Overwhelm, the Decline in Congressional Capacity and Prospects for Reform, which I co-edited along with uh, Timothy Lapira and Kevin Kosar. Uh, it's uh, been a long time coming. Uh, a lot of us have been thinking about the problem of congressional capacity uh, for, for a very long time. And uh, uh, this book brings together some of the leading scholars of Congress uh, with uh, almost 20 essays on the, the state of congressional capacity uh, and is, you know, well, well worth the cover price, whatever the cover price is these days. Um, so uh, I, I'm really thrilled to have um, three uh, distinguished uh, colleagues in the study of Congress uh, with us today, um, who will be talking about uh, this volume and some sort of broader questions that I think are on everybody's mind. Um, uh, about Congress. So let me introduce the panelists. We have Molly Reynolds from the Brookings Institution. Um, James uh, Jones is a professor at the University at Rutgers University Camden and Ruth Block Rubin, who's a professor at the University of, of Chicago. Uh, and so, you know, I think as probably, uh, you know, the, the, the event of, of Congress is um, the January 6th attacks on Congress. Uh, you know, so I think it, it would be great just to kind of, as a way of introducing um, each of us to, to the audience and, and you know, if we could just kind of each reflect a little bit on the January 6th events and maybe talk about some of the ways in which, or we'd love to hear from each of you how your work uh, you know, gives you a lens into thinking about the January 6th attack. And uh, please don't be shy to mention the titles of books and articles that you have written on the topic because people want to know where to find more. So um, with that, um, let me uh, start with, why don't we start with you, James? Uh, thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me on this great panel. Um, so my research looks at the social experiences of Black workers in Congress. My current book project, The Last Plantation, looks at how racism shapes their career experiences uh, and their daily work life, um, and how in return they challenge and resist the inequality that they face. Um, to this end, I spent January 6th and the, the days and weeks after thinking about what does it mean to be a Black person working in Congress? What does it mean to be a staffer of color working in Congress after such a traumatic event? Um, and I mean, thinking about this, uh, uh, about Black workers, workers of color um, across the board um, in Congress. So, you know, um, I think one of the images that immediately popped up um, the night of January 6 was the image or the video footage of Black service workers who had to clean up after insurrectionists, uh, you know, stormed a con uh, Congress, desecrated it. Um, and, you know, I've talked to Black service workers and they do this work with dignity. There's such a pride, um, you know, of doing the work they're doing, doing this in the nation's capital. Um, but that work that they were doing was actually pretty degrading, right? So we're thinking about how they're um, picking up shards, they're cleaning up feces off the wall. So again, this is like a really traumatic and um, degrading experience for them. I was thinking about black staffers, people, staffers of color who um, had to barricade themselves in the um, in the offices. Uh, and you know, r racism is a routine part of working in Congress. One of the interesting things that I've talked to staffers about, it's not necessarily the racism they ex might experience with their colleagues. Um, Congress can be a, a professional workplace, but it's often, often the, the racism that they get, you know, just doing their jobs, talking to people on the phone. It's not their constituents. It's just uh, racists just calling them to harass them in their office. Um, but in many ways, this is, um, that was, you know, it was brought really proximate, right? And that day, if you have people who are entering these halls, um, chanting, um, you know, really racist remarks. And, you know, you know, it wasn't lost on me that like, you know, 
as a black person who's worked in Congress, I could never do this. Um, I've always like approached this space as a, a place that's really dignified. I'm aware of my position in it. Um, and to see a group um, really invade this space and to do that in such a disrespectful way was like really hard to watch. And again, um, this is something that this, these workers have to live with, not only um, as they go on coming to like this, uh, this scene of the crime and again and again. And lastly, I thought about, you know, black um, uh, Capitol Police officers, right? Um, people who were taunted by uh, the rioters who were repeatedly called the N-word. Um, I just recently wrote an op-ed um, for the Daily Beast looking at the sort of this long racial history or racist history of the Capitol Police um, and which, you know, racism is a routine um, part of their daily experiences of their careers. But again, you know, January 6th was different um, in many ways. Ruth, do you wanna jump in with some thoughts? Sure. Um, well, like James, I uh, appreciate uh, able to participate in this conversation. And um, I think having written a lot about factions and how they organize in Congress, often the kinds of connections one draws between the organizations that legislators form and the groups they're representing within the electorate feel kind of tenuous. We think there's these connections between say members of the House Freedom Caucus and individuals who are sympathetic uh, to that cause who visit the voting booth, but often they're not in the same place at the same time. And I think uh, the Capitol riot was an instance where those uh, sentiments felt very acutely connected. Uh, and I'm looking with interest at some of the investigations that are unfolding now, thinking about how legislators may have actually abetted some of those activities by giving tours to the Capitol. Uh, or have subsequently continued to express support for those uh, activities and the ideas that uh, encourage them. And I think um, in some ways it suggests that the work that I have done is um, insufficiently imaginative at, as to an extent that the depth of connections that these organizations can have uh, in sort of connecting the people to Congress, uh, which on the one hand suggests a, a real problem uh, that uh, individuals can feel so entitled to a space uh, in part because of these organizations that they're comfortable waltzing in um, and destroying things um, and at the same time recognizing that these same kinds of organizations can create a sense of belonging for folks who often feel excluded from the political process so thinking more about the congressional black caucus and other organizations like that which can ideally make uh, groups that have every reason to feel like Congress is not serving them well might actually have a sort of stronger say in the political process. And I think that's something that political scientists would do well to attend to. Molly? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, and thanks for having me here with um, James and Ruth today. So the um, work that I do that's featured in the, the book that we're here to talk about uh, today uh, looks at kind of staff capacity uh, in Congress at a pretty high level, kind of how many staff are there, what do they do, uh, what resources does Congress give them to do their jobs. And I think that both the um, actual experience of the insurrection at the Capitol itself, and then what we've seen unfold in the aftermath is really highlights specific cases of a number of bigger, broader challenges that um, I highlight in the work that I do in this volume and elsewhere and the other folks who have been writing and thinking about these issues. So things like funding for the legislative branch. So we know that it is really politically difficult to convince Congress to spend more money on itself and that Congress feels really quite constrained in how much money it can politically allocate to the legislative branch. But then we get to things like within that constrained budget, um, we are, Congress is spending more and more money on the Capitol Police, um, $515 million um, in the current fiscal year, but with notoriously little oversight. So as we kind of look at what happened on the 6th um, and start to investigate kind of where things um, uh, went wrong at a, a management level there. Like we have to confront these questions of, we have these resources, how are they getting used and what 
information is available to Congress itself and the public about how those resources are being spent. Also things like, as we think about um, helping staff, especially staffers um, of, of color in member offices, in committee offices, all the way down to the kind of service workers that James was talking about as we try to make sure that they have access to the resources that they need and that those resources are culturally responsive. Are there, is there the financial wherewithal in Congress to spend money on itself, on the people um, who support its operations in uh, uh, um, when historically Congress has been really um, unwilling uh, to, uh, to spend money uh, to, to bolster its own operations. It also highlights, I think, some important questions about the organization of Congress. Um, Ruth was talking about kind of internal party um, organizations and internal organizations like the Congressional Black Caucus. I, when I say organization, I mean things like, what are the consequences in the aftermath of the insurrection on having a really historically decentralized human resources structure. So we often talk about um, Congress as 535 small businesses. Uh, and there are lots of um, there are lots of services, lots of resources that um, individual offices um, may or may not be well equipped to offer to their um, their employees who survived a traumatic workplace um, incident and then were more or less expected to just go back to work. Um, what are the consequences of having decisions about things like physical, physical security at the Capitol made by people who are responsive to political actors, the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader? Those are really actually sort of basic organizational questions. Um, and then, Lastly, I'll say that as we kind of think about um, staff capacity, we also have to think about kind of workplace management and culture. And so um, James was talking about um, the experience of um, uh, uh, black staff, other staff of, um, of color. And one of the things that we've seen in reporting after um, the attack is the degree to which um, folks in many cases did not feel safe before this happened and then don't feel safe now um, and have trouble imagining how they would feel safe simply going to work to do their jobs again? And what does it mean to have to go to work in a place where um, other people that you interact with um, were, as, as Ruth, Ruth was suggesting, implicitly, explicitly complicit in, um, in this attack on your workplace? And so these are a lot of, again, really specific um, issues that have been surfaced by what happened on January 6th. But I think a lot of cases, they're consistent with lots of bigger, longer term questions that those of us who have been thinking about congressional capacity um, have been reflecting on for a long time. Well, thank you for that. Um, those, those great comments. And, and James, I think I may have erroneously uh, described you as at, at um, Rutgers Camden, when you're actually at, at Rutgers Newark, um, which is which is the, because on your on your Twitter handle, you you describe yourself as Philly Pratt, and I think of like Camden as being close to to, to Philly because it's right across the river. Um, so my apologies. Um, um, so all right, let's um, let's move on um, to talk a little bit about the um, current Congress, um, and let's talk a little bit about a it through a capacity. Framework. I mean, I know that there are tremendous um, issues with the polarization of Congress, the partisanship of Congress, sort of the the overwhelming uh, to do list for Congress. Uh, but what else is holding Congress back? Um, Ruth, let's start with let's start with you here. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that's been striking, I've been following uh, with perhaps uh, unreasonable interest and pleasure, uh, the sort of discovering, as uh, Molly was suggesting, how to run a small business in Congress, the sort of startup costs to how you get your office running and different legislators tweeting about, you know, their strategies and office decor uh, has been quite interesting uh, and perhaps alleviating some of the anxiety about other things. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is to hear that a lot of new incoming members and uh, similarly junior members are not uh, staffing their offices as sort of was traditionally done with a mix of uh, staff who specialize in communications and the staff who specialize in sort of the nitty gritty of legislation, but rather uh, recognizing perhaps that they have a more limited capacity to engage in the legislative process in a meaningful way have opted to staff their uh, offices primarily with communication staffers. And I think this has really profound implications for what happens in Congress and perhaps more uh, 
importantly, what doesn't happen. Uh, and I think sort of speaks to the broader problem of uh, a sort of underinvestment in legislative expertise. And when we talk about expertise, we are not often talking about members of Congress or senators themselves, but their staff. And uh, not that communication staffers do not have their own expertise, but what we typically think Congress should be doing is uh, actually writing laws and um, identifying innovative policy solutions. And that requires experience and knowledge about discrete policy areas. And so um, it's concerning to me that as uh, lawmakers are beginning their new legislative careers that they do not see that there is much value in investing in expert uh, legislative staffers who know about uh, the policy problems that are confronting America today, which seem abundant, uh, and instead are focusing on hiring individuals who can craft a, a particularly sassy tweet, uh, but aren't necessarily going to solve the problems that we have. Molly, how about you? What are what are you thinking about uh, that, that as things other things that are holding Congress back? Yeah, so uh, one thing I've been thinking about um, a lot lately, as we uh, kind of look at the policy landscape that's confronting the new Congress and how this Congress looks like uh, it might tackle some of those policy questions, is the the consequences of um, the relative inexperience of members. So Ruth was talking about sort of new freshman members and junior members getting their offices going, organizing, hiring staff, and I think that um, one of the you know if you pay attention to news reports, one of the things that we see a lot of discussion of is um, the idea that in order to get around expected Republican obstruction in the Senate, the Democrats plan to use a particularly complicated set of legislative procedures known as the budget reconciliation process to try to move some of their big major um, policy priorities, both on responding to the COVID crisis, um, but also responding to kind of broader economic conditions, to economic inequality. Uh, that sort of thing. And these these rules and procedures are really complicated and um, they are um, they're difficult to navigate for even experienced members. But members um, are also uh, we're seeing uh, not necessarily that like that experience in the institution. So if we look at kind of data on um, seniority in both the, the House and the Senate. We go back to the first Congress um, under the Obama administration. So this is 2009. Um, about a third of the members um, in the House in the 111th Congress were in their first, second, or third term, so relatively junior. Um, now it's about 10% higher than that. It's about 43% of the House. I mean, the Senate, over the, the same um, time frame, um, average Senate service is down by about two years. So the average senator in um, uh, 2009 uh, it's served about 14 years. Now it's down to about 12 years. Um, and if we, we look at, again, the sort of plans for the reconciliation process specifically, the last time Congress used the reconciliation process to do um, a big, broad legislative package and the kind that they seem to be um, uh, contemplating this year was in 2005. And only about 20% of the House and about 20% of the Senate were in those current the jobs they currently have um, in 2005. So it's a lot of inexperience, um, which serves to only further consolidate power in the, in the hands of party leaders. Um, on the flip side, um, having all of these um, somewhat less experienced members means that many more of the members have only really served in this period where we've seen a lot of um, <clears throat> reliance on omnibus legislating, <clears throat> excuse me. And so as they sort of contemplate, what does it look like to try to do big things in with as few votes as possible, uh, which I think is basically how we can describe um, uh, the current legislative strategy. That the members are pretty used to that approach. You know, we we saw like the big giant legislative package that passed at the end of last year. And so this is just to say that like as we think about how the current Congress might try and respond to the really big policy uh, challenges facing the country, that um, how long they've been around. Um, and what, how um, the members have kind of been acculturated into the institution is really important.
And Molly, do you have any book recommendations for people who might want to read more about? If, if you, um, if you uh, need to know more about the budget reconciliation process, um, I, um, I wrote a book um, uh, in 2017. It's called Exceptions to the Rule, which is about the reconciliation process and other similar legislative procedures for circumventing the filibuster in the Senate. So if you, um, if you need lots of very granular detail on how the process works, uh, you can find it there. Thank you, Lee. Great. Um, all right, so, uh, James, what, what are you thinking about um, uh, as obstacles that Congress faces uh, uh, I to, kind of like, to legislate this year? Yeah, I think uh, echoing what Ruth and Molly have said, um, I think it's definitely an issue about staff capacity and staff expertise, right? So one, we can sort of see this sort of decline um, in staff um, uh, person, uh, uh, professional personnel, right? And this is something that you guys illustrate in your book. Um, I think uh, one um, data point I'll sort of sort of mention that sort of uh, loops us back to the beginning of the conversation is just uh, thinking about the growth uh, or this the size of capital police. So um, right now, as Molly sort of mentioned, their budget is over five hundred million dollars, which is about ten percent of legislative branch uh, appropriations. Um, this is about a three hundred percent increase over the last two hundred years. Uh, sorry, the last twenty years, right? Uh, one of which has doubled the size of the capital police, right, to about 2,000 sworn officers. Uh, at the same time, the legislative branch has only increased its own budget by 30%, right? Um, and what we sort of see at this time is that, you know, uh, personnel office, uh, personal office and committee office staff in particular are declining, right? Um, and as sort of Ruth mentioned, uh, like this means that uh, there is less expertise amongst these staff. And they, unfortunately members of Congress are choosing to hire more um, communication staff versus staff are who are gonna be engaged in policy work, right? That's sort of the main task of Congress. But I also wanna sort of think about this in terms of not only um, staff capacity, but retaining the staff that Congress does have, right? So um, I'm thinking about this in light of January 6th. So, you know, working in Congress, you know, is a great job. You can make a, a real difference, but you know, this, the pay is low. Um, and, you know, you, there is some of a limit of what uh, members or can sort of do in the policymaking process. So there's not that much room for ent an entrepreneurship or policy entrepreneurship, but also uh, thinking about working in this sort of really um, hostile workplace. Um, all these things I think can affect if um, staffers, staffers of color in particular will, are willing to stay um, and, and work in Congress. And I think this is gonna be something that members of Congress are gonna need to sort of deal with if they want to be effective um, at sort of um, at lawmaking. Great, well, thank you all for, for, for those insightful comments. Um, I wanna move on to another topic that I think a lot of people have questions about, um, which is you know, the extent to which the splits within the Republican party um, are, uh, gonna, are gonna shift uh, at all, um, are gonna widen, are gonna congeal, and you know, what about within the Democratic party? Um, Ruth, you've written a wonderful book about factions in Congress called Building the Block. So um, I, think, I think all of us are really interested into how you see things playing out in this current Congress with, with factions within the parties. Well, with the caveat that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I, I would hazard a guess that we're going to see a lot of fighting, uh, both within the majority and the minority. Although, um, as others have observed, uh, it's a lot easier to hang together when you are in the minority because you can just say no and you don't have to supply an alternative, uh, which uh, Republicans certainly looked far more cohesive when they were in the minority than when they were in the majority. And I think that led a lot of political scientists to overestimate just how unified Republicans were in the first place. And recent politics has suggested uh, they're about as big a mess as Democrats are. Um, but pivoting to Democrats who now, you know, do face this problem of uh, working with President Biden to pass his ambitious legislative agenda, I, I think we should only expect fighting. And so then the question becomes sort of how does Biden and how do congressional leaders try and manage that? Um, and I think there are some interesting things to look out for, one of which is that, and I, I will just state, 
Um, while I think there are a lot of reasons to think that there will be a lot of intra-party fighting at this point, it is worth noting that the status quo is so bad that it may in fact be that everyone agrees something has to be done. And so there's more room to play than there would be in a typical circumstance where um, there are some within the Democratic Party that are reasonably satisfied with the status quo and therefore willing to sort of sit things out or let Republicans uh, throw some wrenches into the policy process. And I think we're less likely to see that now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Democratic leaders are going to have an easy time. Um, and I think here, what's particularly interesting is that, especially within the House, uh, Democrats or different Democratic factions have really done a, re a particularly good job of uh, revitalizing their organizations. So uh, typically, or at least historically, Democratic moderates have been far more organized and disciplined than progressives. This has often been true, uh, but particularly over the last couple of decades, certainly true. The Blue Dogs and New Democrats really have their organizational stuff together, and progressives have been trying to work through the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which uh, until very recently was this sort of very large, cumbersome organization that, while it uh, articulated a lot of really interesting ideas, had a hard time binding its members and ensuring that they could you know, go to the bargaining table with party leaders and say, if you don't do what we want, we're going to keep our votes together and make life hell for you on the floor. And until recently, the Congressional Progressive Caucus just didn't have the organizational apparatus to do any of that, which really limited their capacity to bargain in the way that, say, like the House Freedom Caucus has within the Republican Party. Um, but more recently, they've adopted some similar sort of uh, organizational uh, rules and uh, membership norms that are going to, I think, put the screws to members who consistently say, I'm a CPC member, but don't actually walk the walk. And so it'll be interesting to see whether progressives are able to push back on some of Biden's moderating tendencies. And I think if they're able to do that, that's only going to make Democrat leaders uh, job more difficult because they're going to be facing not only organized uh, moderate members within the Democratic Party, but also an increasingly organized and um, unhappy left. And so it'll be uh, tough sailing, but nevertheless, I think really interesting for us observers. James, how about you? How, how do you see um, uh, the structure of the parties in the current Congress? So I, sorry, I think Ruth is right. I think we should expect um, fighting, right? Both within Democrats and within Republicans. I think the thing that I'm interested in, primarily, I'm looking to see how this is going to unfold. It's like this sort of division between centrist Democrats and progressive Democrats. Uh, in particular, there's sort of this new and rising crop of um, Congress people of color. Um, you know, the squad is growing. So we have new members like Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones, Richie Torres, um, who are, you know, thinking about communications are really, really effective communicators, right? So like to Ruth's point, uh, it'll be really interesting to see how um, this sort of progressive side mobilizes in this new Congress. Um, and I just to say, it's, like, it's really interesting watching these new members of Congress um, you know, get a uh, you know, like get their uh, get acquainted with the institution, right? It, it, they're just different. They're coming from different um, professional backgrounds. So I think about someone like Corey Bush, who was a nurse and an activist, right? She had this really great op-ed in the Washington Post um, following the, um, the Capitol riot, and when she know she talks firsthand about what does it mean to have uh, experienced tear gas on her skin, right? This is not just January 6th, but this is her running for Congress. This is her being an activist uh, for the last couple of years. And so I think there's an urgency to get things done, but, and I think there's an urgency to uh, change the status quo, but I think some members feel that urgency different. Um, and I think they're gonna be really pushing democratic leadership to do more and not less. How about you, Molly? How are you seeing seeing this question? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I um, agree with what both Ruth and um, James have already said. And I think that um, in the spirit of Ruth, when uh, you have a hammer, everything looks like a, a nail. Like I think a lot, obviously, about the, the rules um, of both the, the House and the Senate. And I think that one thing that we're going to um, be reminded of pretty quickly is that um, the rules, even when you have ones available to you that allow you to get around um, certain kinds of obstruction, especially in the Senate, um, they can't force agreement where agreement doesn't exist. And so as we think about kind of what, um, as um, 
as James was just saying about uh, a, um, a reinvigorated um, new uh, um, new member uh, uh, coalition um, uh, within the Democratic Party. Um, Ruth was talking about the, the blue dogs versus the, the progressives. As we think about kind of these factions within the, the Democratic Party um, in both the, the House and the Senate, like even when we have um, rules available that uh, Congress might use to try and do things like get around the, the filibuster, like we're there, that's not, they're not magic. They're not gonna um, help, um, help force agreement if the underlying policy agreement um, isn't there. And like, this is a really important lesson for the democratic majority to learn from the 2017 Republican majority where they came in, they tried to do something they had been promising that they would do for basically a decade, um, which is Appeal Obamacare. Um, uh, they tried to do it in a way that was not subject to a filibuster in the Senate, and they failed. Um, we all remember John McCain going to the floor with the famous thumbs down in the middle of the night, and it's because even when the when the rules allowed them to act um, without the threat of a filibuster in the Senate, that they um, the, the underlying um, agreement wasn't um, wasn't there. And then the, the other um, thing that I've been thinking a lot about in this um, in this context is we think about potential rule change and things like. Will Democrats choose to abolish the legislative filibuster in the Senate? Is we, um, if we are thinking that the filibuster might go away, we have to ask ourselves, what's the issue that breaks the dam on the filibuster um, for? For Democrats, what is the the issue on which they get sufficiently united? Think is um, is really important. Can't be done any other way except um, uh, by eliminating the filibuster, and that they're facing such a Republican intransigence on that they're willing to um, uh, willing to uh, change the, the way the Senate works. Um, I think that um, some sort of voting rights legislation, some sort of democracy reform is a possibility. It was really important and telling, I think, when former President Obama came out at John Lewis's funeral last summer and said that if it takes eliminating the filibuster to pass a new Voting Rights Act, Democrats should do it. Um, I think there, there are some other possibilities, but we have to ask ourselves, do you think there's something that breaks the dam? And then you ask, what's upriver? What are other things that maybe aren't so important that they'd actually break the dam, but that could flow through more easily? And there again, we get into um, big important questions about what different parts of the party, um, where their priorities are, what they want to work on, um, what uh, what electorally vulnerable members want on or off the agenda as the party looks towards trying to hold their majority after the midterms when we know that the president's party um, historically loses seats. So there's lots of, lots of moving pieces here, but they all kind of come back, for me at least, to the idea that um, at the end of the day, you need to build agreement on the substance um, uh, and that the, the rules can't do that for you. So I'm gonna have two more questions for the panelists um, and then we'll open it to audience questions. So if there are audience questions, um, start typing them. Um, all right, so penultimate question for the panelists, um, turning to the possibilities for this Congress, um, uh, news came down a few days ago that the uh, House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress has been reauthorized for um, yet another go at making Congress better. So uh, what what should they do this time around? What, what should their top top number one priority be this time around? Um, let's let's start this time with you, James. Right. Um, so I think one of the things that came out of uh, the last um, Committee on Modernization was its emphasis on um, diversity and inclusion. So um, making permanent the Office of Diversity, diversity and Inclusion in the House. And there was also language which, you know, you know prioritize hiring um, uh, racially inclusive like practices, right? Um, I think this is great. I think this is also um, setting the bar really low for what Congress should do to have an um, inclusive and equitable workplace. Um, I think one of my recommendations would be around transparency, right? So um, as we were talking about um, staff capacity, it's important to question to ask is like who actually works in Congress, right? We actually don't really know that 
uh, the answer to that question, uh, particularly as it relates to race and gender and even class. Uh, so one of the things that Congress can do is collect demographic data on its workplace um, and its workforce. Um, so, you know, when Congress passed the Congressional Accountability Act um, in 1995, it extended 13 federal workplace laws um, to the congressional workplace, things about, you know, not discriminating. One of the things it left out was um, you know, collecting this demographic data. And this demographic, this demographic data has been really important for researchers um, across the field and measuring the pre uh, presence of discrimination. It lets us um, investigate if there are disparities in hiring, promotion, and retention. Uh, without this, it makes Congress a sort of enigma. We don't know who works there. We don't know how race and gender um, factor into the sort of hiring and promotion process. Uh, so my, my push would be for them to collect uh, demographic data um, and to actually make this data available uh, to researchers to make sure um, that we are having a fair uh, congressional workplace. Congress um, started to do this um, last summer. Um, I released a policy paper with pay our interns. It's called The Color of Congress and it looks at who, um, who Congress was um, hiring as interns, right? I mean, people think about interns as the most junior people in Congress, but you know, in many ways, this is a gateway into paid employment. It's also um, a, a gateway into elective office, right? I was really struck by Kamala Harris's um, resignation speech in which she sort of talks about, you know, her, her, um, her experience as a Howard undergrad working for Alan Cranston as an intern in the Senate. Um, but you know there are there's no record keeping about at all about who Congress hires. Um, people just forget. Um, some offices that I surveyed have really good records of who they hire as interns, and then there's don't. Uh, but particularly as Congress has moved to pay their interns, we should have records of who they're um, hiring. Um, if this money is going to the students who need um, money the most, right? So my push would be for Congress to be more transparent about who's hiring, to collect demographic data um, as a measure to sort of um, um, guard against anti-discrimination and equal opportunity. Molly, do you have thoughts on um, what the uh, modernization committee should prioritize this time around? So first of all, I agree with everything that James just said as someone who has um, made uh, valiant attempts to track some information about um, how many people work in Congress. It is it's hard um, and when uh, well-meaning um, folks on the Hill, including um, members of the select committee ask questions of those of us who think about congressional capacity, one of my responses is always to say like, we can try and answer some of those questions that you're asking, but we could give you much, much better answers if you gave us better data. <laughs> so um, everything, I agree with everything that, um, that James just said. Um, in terms of things that the, the committee should um, continue to focus on um, in the new Congress, um, I have two. Um, one is, um, again, continuing to make sure that there are um, changes made to the kind of congressional human resources structure um, and, and funding apparatus to provide um, resources to staff as they continue to, um, to grapple with what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and then also, um, more work on continuity of, um, of Congress and of congressional operations. And as I, I think that as we, um, as we go on, we, we learn more and more about ways in which um, uh, sort of things could have been even worse than they have been for Congress in terms of COVID and being able to operate um, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, you know, we can talk about proxy voting in the House, which has been, to my mind, kind of a second best um, option for how to how to deliberate remotely. Um, it's the best that they could do in the time frame and with the political circumstances that they were facing, but like they could do better. Um, and so just making sure that the next time something happens and there will be another thing that happens um, that makes it difficult for Congress to operate in person in the way it historically has, making sure that both the House and the Senate are much, much better prepared for everything from how to have staff operate and work remotely um, all the way up to how do you deliberate um, on the floor uh, or on the floor of both chambers when it is unsafe or impossible for members to gather in person. Ruth? 
Um, well, in addition to seconding uh, both James and Molly's suggestions, I, I would say uh, recent political events have led me to think that two things are more important than I thought they were, at least initially, or the first time we were thinking about some of these issues. And um, one builds on, I think, Molly's uh, apt recommendation. And, and that's, I think, to encourage the committee to think about ways to institutionalize within Congress uh, a move to thinking about the unthinkable or to imagine what we haven't yet imagined. And so whether that's like a special committee that starts to think about some of the issues Molly's identifying, some kind of institutionalized way such that folks aren't scrambling at the last minute, you know, not to add to the committee structure necessarily, but I do think having an institutionalized way to be thinking about some of these questions uh, in a way that a lot of intelligence agencies do and other parts of government would be really useful. I also um, would say with, uh, well, um, putting aside my, I think, often cynical political science hat, I think the select committee's recommendations to encourage civility and bipartisanship uh, seem all the more important. Uh, it was really hard to read uh, accounts by uh, sitting members about how they feared for their lives and they worried about members in the room with them uh, in lockdown, perhaps abetting uh, individuals who were trying to kill them. And to the extent that Congress can be thinking about ways to make people feel closer to each other, or at least to recognize that there's a lot of common ground on which people operate seems really important. And in that way, I think the Select Committee on Organization in Congress historically has been a place where members have come together from across the aisle and recognize that they have a lot of shared priorities. And I think that's certainly true for uh, the Select Committee this time around. And so to the extent that, um, there's camaraderie that's built up, I think would certainly, like there's no, we can't expect uh, sort of different populations in the country to possibly come together if we can't even expect individuals who are paid to be in the same room get along with each other. And so to the extent that we can, you know, attempt to foster understanding across these different areas by whether that's focusing on policy instead of partisanship or by some other expedient, I think that would be really useful. And I think in a way that's more substantive than simply, you know, saying, well, you all just need to drink more beer together. I think we all recognize that is insufficient. Uh, and so sort of having a, a, a sort of a, a more granular way to really recognize that there are uh, areas of commonality would be useful. Well, great. So I'm going to move on to my final question and then we'll open it up to some of the audience questions that have been coming in. Um, you know, uh, this, you know, this volume is about congressional capacity, uh, you know, conceived broadly as, you know, the, the ability of Congress to have the resources to, to do its job. Um, and, and the volume is really about how Congress is, is overwhelmed by the demands upon it and the, the lack of internal capacity it has to handle those demands. Um, but, you know, I think something certainly in light of the, um, of the, of the events of January 6th and perhaps broader challenges that Congress faces, you know, what else besides capacity and polarization uh, should we be focusing on? Is, is capacity even the right question to be focused on? I think it's a, a moment for being self-critical here too. Uh, as we 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 expand our thinking, um, so uh, so Ruth, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Well, this has been something I've been thinking a lot about, um, and I suppose it it depends on what we think the problem is. Um, if we look to the um, seeming disaffection with what government is doing, or uh, disbelief that the electoral outcomes we all believed to be true are in fact reality. If that is at all related to Congress seemingly unable to solve the problems that give people faith in government and lead people to trust their legislators, then I think investing and emphasizing legislative capacity makes a lot of sense. Um, if that's not the problem, uh, then I, I don't know that um, focusing on a lack of congressional capacity as opposed to other issues uh, is the right way to go. Um, but I suppose uh, if one adopts the physician practice of like, A, first do no harm, but B, um, if th things aren't working, like try anything, um, it seems here like there's no harm to improving legislative capacity. 
Um, and certainly the status quo is so untenable that it can't help but be productive. But whether it is in fact going to heal the rifts that I think we've all seen and, and many people have been pointing to have existed long before, then I think um, we may be needing to look towards solutions that are beyond Congress's can. And um, that's unfortunate for those of us who study Congress, but on the other hand, means we get to sort of punt to, to other experts. Molly? Yeah, so I think that um, improving congressional capacity and all of the areas that we've talked about that um, other chapters in this volume talk about is necessary, but not sufficient for Congress to be able to address the problems of the country. So um, if we think about a lot of the kind of big picture uh, pro-democracy reforms that are on the table, so Lee, your um, uh, breaking the two-party doom loop book um, speaks to a lot of these. Um, I was talking before about something that um, might be easier but is still difficult, which is eliminating the legislative filibuster in the Senate, um, because even if you get rid of that, you're still facing down um, a really malapportioned institution that overrepresents rural white interests. So even with all of these big problems on the table um, and these big things that are making it difficult for Congress um, to, uh, to address the, the needs of the country, even if we were to um, make any of these reforms to get to um, uh, uh, make changes, we would still need a better resourced, more effective Congress. That the last thing that that um, I want is to is for us to do the really hard political work of making bigger change and then find ourselves with a Congress that's not up to the task of following through on what um, uh, what other actors have what kind of change other actors have been able to, um, to make possible. And so we need, we need, we need folks who um, are experts on the areas that they work in, who can build long um, and well compensated careers on the Hill where their, where their like workplace benefits are not political footballs that get tossed around by partisan actors. And so we, we need all of this infrastructure. If any of the bigger, much harder to achieve uh, reforms are to make a real difference um, uh, in our ability uh, as a country to solve the problems we face. James? Yeah, so I think congressional capacity is the right way to look at this, but also that when we're thinking about congressional capacity, we have to also um, uh, think about it in terms of inequality, right? So we have to be certain if we're going to expand congressional capacity that we don't necessarily exacerbate or reproduce inequalities that are um, currently existing within the congressional workplace, right? So oftentimes we talk about fat capacity in this sort of race and uh, gender neutral language, right? Um, and that language is problematic because it obscures a workplace that's dominated by whites, where there are uh, gendered positions, thinking about comms work, um, and that overwhelmingly privileges affluence, right? It's not everyone can work on the Hill. You just, oftentimes it requires a sort of supplemental income from your family or working a second job. Race and class and gender affects uh, how you get to Capitol Hill, once you're there, your experience and what you can do. And then also ultimately what happens when you leave, where you can go and what you can do, right? So I think as we're thinking about strengthening um, Congress and expanding its uh, capacity, we have to make sure that we're doing so in a way in which um, advances anti-racist principles, anti-racist principles, excuse me. Well, we've got a lot of work to do. Um... <laughs> Um, so we'll move over to the audience questions now, um, and I, I will start with um, a question that is dear to my heart about electoral reform that comes from an audience member. I promise it's not a plant, um, but John asked whether watching Lisa Murkowski's behavior since Alaska passed RCV and her colleagues' behavior towards her uh, has or notes that it's been amazing. So John is interested in what extent uh, our, and that's, that's um, you know, because Alaska passed RCV in the last ballot election, um, you know, what, what impact could, you know, could RCV have? And, you know, more broadly, it's also the Alaska top four primary model plus RCV, you know, it, I mean, I think we could even broaden it, it out. And this is, you know, a question that, that, certainly I've thought a lot about is, you know, how much of a problem 
is our election system and the electoral pressures that members face and pathways in order to get reelected. And I'll open it up to all of the panelists. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start by saying um, you never, I don't think you ever want to hang too many lessons on kind of Lisa Murkowski's individual experience. Um, you know, the she did win um, a re-election once as a write-in candidate. Um, uh, I believe it was 2010 um, with, a, with a not easy to spell last name um, on, the, on the ballot. Um, but I think this broader question of what does it, um, what does our electoral system mean for the incentives that members of Congress face and how they behave while in office, I think is really important. And so I think um, to uh, some of the things that Ruth was raising before, that if we wanna change the way that members behave in the institution, we need to change, we may need to change some of the ways that we select who gets there. Um, and particularly that we may need to think about, you know, how do our current electoral institutions incentivize the kind of behavior um, that means that you go to Congress and you just use it as a platform from, from which to make speeches and message to the public as opposed to a platform to do actual legislative work. Obviously there are changes that we might need to make within the institution uh, that speak to that as well. Um, but I do think that, um, again, as we as we think about like, why is Congress the way it is? Some of these questions um, about um, about electoral institutions are, are really important ones to ask. Anybody else wanna weigh in? Yeah, can I just follow up with Molly said? So I think we definitely need to have um, democracy reform and how we sort of um, elect our uh, candidates. But like, I think also like, that's also under the purview of Congress and how this institution is set up, right? So again, a reason why I'm really emphatic on thinking about inequality and um, amongst congressional staffers because in congressional em um, employment is a pathway uh, to elected office, right? So in the 116th Congress, about one fifth of members were either an intern or a staffer. Right? So it matters who, um, who, who gets to work in Congress because and oftentimes you, before you can work, uh, before you can leave Congress, you need to work in Congress, right? So I'm thinking about this also in terms about race, gender, and class. I think about people like um, uh, Ayanna Presley, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Lauren Underwood. These are people, black women, women of color, who have all worked in Congress, but who are now um, advancing and pushing Congress to do uh, greater and better things, right? So I think part of that question is thinking about how we vote on uh, vote candidates, but also how do we nurture um, these like these politicos, right? How do we support them? How do we train them? Um, uh, and like, it's, I think this also goes about um, this is related to about access and um, and the congressional workplace. Just one thing to add to James's point, because I think it's a really great one, is that when we think about, um, I think we probably all in our heads um, have members that we think of as really effective members. And I think that a lot of those folks are folks who had previous experience in the institution, um, both the, the folks that he, he mentioned. Um, I think, you know, we were talking about the select committee before. There are a number of folks who I think were effective members of the select committee in the last Congress who sort of first came to Congress as the result of having been um, staffers both uh, in Washington and at the the, um, the district level. We haven't um, really touched on the importance of um, state and district staff to the way that Congress works and to Congress's capacity. But um, to um, it, this is, it's yet another reason why, um, as James really importantly highlights, caring about the pathways into elected office is really important because it shapes kind of how you approach the job once you get there. I also wanted to jump in and note, just as it's important to pay attention to the pathways into Congress, it's important to understand the pathways out of Congress or the things that cause people to retire or may prevent them from running in the first place. If one purpose of ranked choice voting is to encourage more moderate members to run, folks who might not get the party strong endorsement or toe the party line on a lot of issues, individuals like Murkowski, uh, we wanna pay attention to the experience of congressional moderates in Congress and a lot of them do not seem to enjoy it and retire pretty quickly. And many people 
often choose not to run. And so we have a pipeline problem, not simply when it comes, as James was arguing, to diversity, but into sort of ideological diversity. It's a lot more pleasant to be a firebrand in Congress today than it is to be a moderate. And that can be good depending on your politics, but it can also be bad, particularly if you care about more bipartisan legislation passing. Great. Well, obviously, I think it's it's pretty important. Um, uh, all of these all of these questions about both the pipeline and the and the electoral incentives. Um, and you know, I think it's something I, I would agree with what everyone said here. And I think it's really something that Congress needs to think more about. Um, I'm going to wrap two questions here um, together. Um, one question is, should Congress bring back the Office of Technology Assessment, um, which I think everybody on the panel would probably say yes to, although correct, I think I think that seems to be a universal consensus among people who think about congressional capacity. So, but I, I'll just leave that out there in case anybody wants to add anything more to and that. I think Second, that. I think that, um, uh, I think where the consensus is, is that Congress needs much more capacity to effectively make policy in uh, kind of technical areas that require a lot of scientific and technological expertise. The question of kind of what, and this is, this is, I think, a generally important question when we think about congressional reform is that there can be a lot of consensus on big uh, ideas or ideas at kind of a high level. And then the question of how you actually design uh, an institution within Congress to provide that expertise um, is a separate question entirely. So um, the when the question is phrased, should we bring back the OTA? Like, I actually don't think there's broad agreement. Uh, maybe there is on this panel um, uh, on that specific um, organizational form. But I, I my my sense from the, the um, congressional reform community is that this is a particular particular substantive area where Congress's um, capacity is is really lacking um, and really has not kept up with um, external with changes outside of the institution. Yeah, let me actually. That's a great point. That it's you know, I mean, I think I think I, I kind of view the Office of Technology assess bring back the OTA as kind of like a stand-in for Congress needs more expertise on on technology and maybe it's not maybe. Office of Technology Assessment is, is a is not a great name, and maybe you should think about how to to reinvent it with a with a better branding. But whatever. Um, but yet, yet as you as as you know, Molly, despite there being I think some broad consensus in the congressional reform community, it has not actually happened. Uh, which then you know takes to another question. Um, sorry, that quest that that previous question was from Runal. Um, uh, this is a question from Garrett, which is how does Congress make a budget increase for itself politically palatable? So, I mean, I guess there's there's kind of two, I, I just want to expand on that a little bit. One is the sort of politics of how you do internal congressional reform. And, you know, that's both the public facing politics and the internal within Congress politics, which probably are connected because if, if there's consensus within Congress, it's easier to, to sell it to the public than for it to be a partisan issue. Um, but just, just open that up to our, our panelists here. If anyone uh, wants to, to weigh so in. So I'm like, I'm curious about how much Congress needs to actually sell this, right? Um, it's, I think this is a different question, like um, expanding legislative capacity versus actually raising members' salaries. I think that's something completely different Hot, and but, hot button issue. But I think when we were talking about staff and like what Congress can do, I, I'm not sure, how, maybe this may be being naive, how controversial this is um, and how much voters are actually gonna pay attention to it, right? I think if you want to make this much more palatable, <laughs> this all goes back to thinking about, um, you know, congressional staff as a as a marker of citizenship, right? Um, you're thinking about increasing access, right? So I think you know one ways in which you can sort of make this more palatable is like thinking about what Congress has done over the last couple of years, which is to start paying their interns, right? But to do this in a way to sort of sell this program as like, hey, we are rewarding our constituents. We are trying to, um, you know, help out people. Um, I think 
there has been a lot of talk within like the last uh, year about black candidates and you know their rise from HBCUs. I would love to see a program where Congress sort of uh, expands this capacity by working with HBCU graduates and building a pipeline there. And so I think there are definitely ways in which lawmakers can um, build and expand um, uh, legislative capacity by thinking about Congress as a site for minority empowerment. Um, really empowering citizens to really um, um, be a part of government. And I think, you know, this, this pays multiple dividends. So one is like thinking about increasing access to um, uh, elected office, but it's also about like really renewing citizenship, um, the belief in government, right? So I'll so tell a quick story. You know, I worked in, I was an intern in Congress in 2006. I thought I would be a member of Congress, but I realized quickly it wasn't for me. But it was really interesting as I would go home uh, and be with my family. It's like, well, James is working in Congress. They thought about Congress and this institution differently because I work there, right? Um, they was like, oh, what's happening there? Um, does it work? Um, and I, so I think as we sort of expand legislative capacity, you sort of get these ambassadors for Congress, um, everything they do. So it might not be that they're gonna have long tenures in Congress. It may not be that they're gonna run for office one day, but they're gonna have that experience and they're gonna carry that with them and they're gonna share that with everyone um, who they encounter, right? So I think Congress can expand its legislative capacity and they can do that in a way and sell it as a way of building our democracy. So I, um, I love that framing that James just offered. And when I think about this problem, I think about it less as is it, aside from some particular hot button pieces, which are themselves important, um, what we pay members and how that is implicitly or explicitly tied to the maximum pay available to, to staff is, is important. Um, but this always strikes me as an issue where members believe it to be politically unpopular, even if it isn't actually politically unpopular. So one big step for me would be convincing them that it might actually be more popular than they think it is, um, or at least less unpopular than they think it is. And maybe um, maybe that's going, uh, making an argument um, in the, using the frames that um, that James has just offered. And maybe there, there are others, but I think that this is the place where what is actually true and what, what members believe to be true um, uh, may not be the same, but that we need to figure out how to convince members that there are investments that they can make in the institution, in their offices, that um, are potentially much more politically palatable than they believe to be true. Yeah, I, want, I think uh, both James and Molly have made excellent points. And I guess um, the one thing I'd add is that I, I do think we need collectively a more productive way to talk about how we distribute quote benefits. I think we often have an all or nothing conversation where you know, just judging from how uh, folks talk about at the state level, uh, sort of better benefits that we are offering to city or state employees. It's often a, well, I don't have this, so why should you? I mean, and I do think that's something that members internalize where they're concerned that constituents are going to look at um, what we would think of as very basic accommodations or benefits, like paid maternity leave. Uh, where you think, you know, this is going to make it more possible for a diverse group of people to work for Congress um, that, you know, because they don't have that or not every workplace provides that, that Congress shouldn't. And I think what's often frustrating about those conversations is that if anybody should be doing it, if anyone can sort of set a benchmark for what is appropriate behavior, or what are, you know, basic rights that you should have as an employee, it should be an institution of government like Congress. And so I think to, to the point uh, that both Molly and James are making about sort of reframing these issues that we should try and if, there, if it's at all possible to have conversations that don't assume that if everybody isn't receiving um, the same uh, kind of employment benefit that it's a non-starter for government officials to provide that to their staff. Right? That seems like a really problematic race to the bottom way to think about employment, which means that you're not gonna get the best and the brightest wanting to walk the halls of Congress and serve our representatives who we vote for, which is crazy. Um, and you know, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I do think it means 
recognizing, as Molly was suggesting, that members do believe this and thinking about creative ways to change the way we have these conversations so that we can do what needs to be done. So I'm going to pull one final question from the audience, um, uh, which, you know, which Matthew raises um, that, you know, basically Congress has been failing to address more and more issues. And he asks the question whether this is because of polarization or declining congressional capacity. And I'm, I'm going to kind of break out of that binary framing and instead ask a, a broader question. And this can be a concluding question, which is, you know, to what extent are these sort of major problems of Congress all part of one big problem? And to what extent do they influence each other or to what extent are they a bunch of different problems? Uh, and uh, why, don't we, why don't we go uh, James, Ruth, Molly for, for this round? Um, I think it's a good question. Uh, I think these are both uh, related. Um, so I think there is definitely polarization in Congress, obviously. Um, but I still think there is an opportunity for Congress to get things done. Um, again, I think it's the, uh, the question is like, how, are, how is Congress doing its work? Um, and it, is this the best way it should be doing it? Uh, I've like pointed to over the conversation a number of the ways in which it's like not really uh, the best workplace. It's one in which it's quite unequal. Um, and I think that inequality is in many ways a way in which is uh, contributing to sort of this sort of low uh, approval of this institution, but also a, what, uh, a way in which Congress is sort of missing um, missing the mark, right? So part of the reason why I think diversity is important is so you can have really rich deliberation. You can make sure that um, different perspectives are included. But when everyone looks um, at the looks the same way, you know, nothing is uh, really getting done. Um, and when everyone sort of you're sort of getting sorry the same perspective. One of the interesting thing um, about um, research on diversity and inclusion. Um, is that it's shown that diverse work teams produce innovation. Um, they, they think outside the box. Um, so again, I, I would sort of make a push, you know, for Congress to be much more inclusive um, um, and who, who they're hiring, in part because, you know, bringing in different actors can help um, solve this legislative gridlock by thinking outside of the box, right? So I think that there's definitely polarization, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Congress cannot get things done. Um, I think there needs to be a, a more attention on how they're doing things and what are the, the social implications for that. Um, yeah, I, I think um, th this is a, a challenging question and, and I do appreciate the feeling um, that uh, maybe when one reads a lot about congressional reform that it feels like a kind of whack-a-mole problem where you solve one problem and suddenly there's a new one and, and then you know enough things change and then suddenly the terrain is altered and the thing that you thought was working is or was going to solve your problem in the long term hasn't. And I think um, polarization has shifted the terrain quite a bit and has changed a lot of the incentive structures, but hasn't necessarily fundamentally altered the way our institutions function. And so thinking about uh, sort of reform over the long term or thinking about how we design our institutions to function better, I do think sort of the fundamentals are all there and apparent to us and part of the challenge uh, for the lawmakers who are charged with thinking about uh, the kinds of reforms that they'll continue to recommend to Congress as a whole is to think about these sort of unintended consequences that often then become sticky and hard to solve. And if to the extent that we can minimize those, uh, that would seem to be paying it forward to the next generation. Um, there are a lot of problems that are gonna crop up that we're not gonna be able to solve, but if we can avoid creating new ones, that would seem to be really beneficial. And so that's, I think, one of the sort of fundamental charges of thinking about the different reforms that are explored in uh, Lee and Tim and Kevin's book is precisely this. You know, What do we know about what's wrong with Congress? What do we know about what's right with Congress? And what do we know about implementing reforms that are going to help with the good things and minimize creating more problems that we're going to have to subsequently add to our list of the bad stuff. And I realize that's pretty abstract, but I do think that sort of captures the fundamental challenge. Um, and then it really, to Molly's point, goes down to the nitty gritty of what specific reform you're contemplating. 
uh, to sort of be able to adjudicate among these different issues. I think what I'll, what I'll add um, is that one important way in which I see sort of the kind of big broad forces in American politics, including polarization, linked to this conversation that we're having about congressional capacity is the degree to which our politics have made Congress a thing to be run against as an institution. So we can point to lots and lots of examples where Congress does not make investments in itself because it thinks that and members think that the right political move is to uh, complain about the institution. Um, and this becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one of these, um, I think one really important recent example is the experience um, on Capitol Hill with COVID testing over the past um, almost a year. So it took a really long time for the political leaders in both chambers to embrace the idea that um, they should be providing members and staff um, who needed to come to work with COVID tests. Um, it started as best I can tell because they didn't wanna seem like they were getting something that Americans couldn't get access to. Um, but as Ruth said before, like we elect these people to do the work of the country. And so we need, we need to create an institution that allows them to um, like take some of these things um, uh, to sort of, again, embrace the, the institution as a, as a thing to be made to work better and not as a thing to be blamed for um, its own failings. Um, and, to, and I think that our politics have made, um, made that um, a politically um, uh, expedient position to take in a lot of circumstances. And so I think as we try to go forward, figuring out how to make Congress, again, something that members believe is worth investing in, um, and uh, I'll just say one thing about the select committee before we go is that like that I think has been one of the even to the extent that um, some of the nearly 100 things the select committee recommended in the last Congress, whatever they choose to work on in the current Congress, like those are really important recommendations, but the degree to which that group of House members has been building a, a coalition um, and a constituency within the House for making the House work better, um, I think is one of its really important things going forward to combat some of, um, some of this overall dynamic. Well, thank you um, to our, uh, a virtual round of applause. I guess we can clap for each other and, and people can hear us. Um, so um, uh, thank you to James, Molly, and Ruth. Um, check out all of their books, as well as this beautiful volume of Congress Overwhelmed with 17 essays. So it's like a, it's like, it's like 17 books in one. It's like a really exciting um, with, with essays by Molly and Ruth and, and many others. Uh, and uh, thank you all. Uh, and this is a conversation that will continue. So let's, uh, let's hope Congress can get its act together this year. All right. Thank you all.